Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gill at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Charles Lipson, who taught international relations at the University of Chicago, where he was professor in political science and the college. His research deals with international cooperation and conflict and with political aspects of the world economy. Welcome, Charles. Delighted to be with you, Gil. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So, um, uh, as I mentioned, you know, I don't have a lot of uh, knowledge in this area, Charles. What I think about typically is science and economics. Uh, but I want to sort of reveal my bias and, and ask you a few questions looking forward. So, so one of the things I want to say up front is, you know, the, the quote from Edgar Mitchell, I don't know if you know it, it this was an astronaut from the Apollo 14, uh, 14 mission uh, when he was looking looking at the Earth from the moon, he said something like, you develop an instant global consciousness, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world, and a compulsion to do something about it. Uh, he says you want to grab a politician by the scruff of the neck and drag him a quarter of a million miles out and say, look at that, you son of a bleep. <laughs> uh, and- this quote talks to me uh, quite a bit. Uh, obviously, from the space, we don't see any countries. We don't see um, U.S., Mexico, India, Pakistan, Israel, Palestine, not even Russia, Ukraine. Uh, it just seems like, you know, it's a, a, a place that seems to be in distress. And so what I want to ask you is, um, what is the status of, you know, sort of international relations. We hear a lot about dem- de- democracy in general. Uh, do we really have democracy today in the world? We have democracy in many countries uh, uh, led by Western Europe, um, North America, uh, and Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Australia. Uh, but um, Democracy is under threat in a number of areas, and the people who wrote about the end of uh, ideological conflict when the United States finally uh, won the Cold War and the Soviet Union collapsed, I think all that optimism has declined with not only with the rise of China, but with people becoming very aware of the high levels of repression, even genocide within China. Right, right. And, you know, even other countries, um, India, for example, the largest democracy is sort of a one party democracy today. Um, We have the U.S., you know, I I sometimes think about a thought experiment. So suppose a group of extraterrestrials land in Washington, and we sort of teach them what democracy is. Um, you know, every person has a vote. 
regardless of color of skin, sex, religion, and so on. Right. And uh, they vote for one of the candidates, regardless of the color of the skin, sex, and religion. And if they if they analyze what happens in the U.S., would that would they consider that to be dem- democracy? Well, the United States has never uh, been a pure democracy. It was always a representative democracy. So that yeah. we, for the most part, a- a- as you s- stated in your hypothetical example, we elect representatives. The uh, the founding fathers, sometimes now just called the founders. Uh, were very concerned not only to prevent pure democracy, which they felt could override. What if uh, there are three of us in the room and two of us vote to uh, remove a lot of Gill's rights? You would say, well, that that may be democratic, but it's anti-freedom. So uh, the founders were very concerned about preserving certain kinds of individual freedoms, but they were also very concerned about avoiding the centralization of power um, in the hands of one or a few people because they were very fearful that that could lead to tyranny as well. So the American system was particularly noteworthy in dividing sovereign power between Congress and the president, between the central government and the states and so on. This has often led uh, to great, uh, to real obstacles in the government acting very decisively, um, except in cases of national emergency, but it also was designed to prevent this kind of tyranny. So yes, I would say we have a democracy, but you do see threats to it, like uh, the invasion of the Capitol on the 6th of January, uh, 2021. Yeah, so so federalism um, seems to have helped us quite a bit. Uh, How do we contrast that um, with with the UK and and the European democracies? Are are they more unitary in in their approach? Oh, yes, they're much more unitary. I I would say that uh, uh, the American system is, is distinctive, but there is a sharp difference, I think, between the Anglo-Saxon systems and uh, the continental European systems, which largely, uh, which are more centralized. And one of the big differences lies in the legal system. In America, especially in criminal trials and so forth, um, ultimately you are convicted or uh, found not guilty by a jury of your peers, not by a judge. Um, and the the judge reads the jury the law, and there is what is uh, there is a contested nature of our um, of our legal system. That is, uh, if you were suing me, let's say over a, a patent or a copyright or some such uh, something, yeah. many of your listeners are quite familiar with. Uh, there would be, uh, you would have your lawyers and I would have my lawyers and we would fight back and forth. And then sometimes a judge would decide that, or it could be a jury trial and a jury would make the final decision. And then we have a right to appeal in, in, uh, European and continental systems. These are much more decided by expert, uh, judges so that there's no popular involvement. I would also say that there's a crucial difference between a system like the American and uh, the Anglo-Saxon, the uh, the British uh, and Commonwealth countries, which is called first-past-the-post voting. <laughs> Mainly, if I get 51% and you get 49%, uh, In America, I win. Look at how close uh, all the elections were for president state by state. But in uh, most countries, uh, we would basically get the same number of parliamentary representatives. And under that system, there's not a lot of incentive, actually, to remain as part of one party. In Israel, for example, 
if you and I were part of the same party uh, initially, but you had a yeah. lot of personal followers, they were Gil Eppin followers, and I had <laughs> Charles Lipson followers, I might form my yeah. own separate party because I could then get at my 10 or 15% of the vote would lead to several representatives in the parliament in Israel called mm -hmm. the Knesset. And from them, there would be likely no majority party and the majority would have to be put together as a coalition of all these small parties. So there are lots of different forms of democracy, but what's striking about most of them is that they do believe in the rule of law. They do have property rights. They do have individual rights, which cannot be crushed by the government. And going back to your point about the uh, astronaut, uh, we yeah. also need communities. And one thing that the EU hoped to be able to do was form something that looked like a European community, not in the legal sense, but in the sense that people didn't think of themselves as French or Italian or German, uh, but as Europeans first and foremost. And that really hasn't happened. Uh, so um, there the problem is creating these political unions that have something to do with the social structure uh, of the populations that lie beneath them. Yeah, so so I wondered, Charles, whether there's a scale problem, mm -hmm. which is uh, perhaps a unitary system works within you know certain small scale. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what the number is. Let's mm -hmm. say less than hundred. Um, but when you go beyond that, then um, a lot of the downsides uh, that you talked about all, all becomes more problematic. Is that, is that the way to think oh, about it? Oh, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, <laughs> interestingly, Gil, that was one of the questions that the Founding Fathers wrote about directly yeah. in the Federalist Papers. And they're, because remember, when the United States was being formed, and I'm not talking about in 1776, but a decade or more later when they were writing the Constitution, there had never been a representative democracy on a large scale like America. And their mm -hmm. argument was that there were all kinds of factions in the country. There were people who wanted more trade and people who wanted protection. And there were people who wanted uh, uh, a certain kind of uh, privileges for farmers and people who wanted privileges for people in cities and so forth. And what they said was that actually, if you had a larger, um, a larger country and a larger democracy, these different factions would cut against each other and would make the country more stable. Now, Alexis de Tocqueville, writing about 50 years later, said that that might be true, but that what was really uh, making America such a vibrant democracy was that we had local democracies, that people worked at the local level, not only as on, on juries and in local government, but in all kinds of civic associations. They get together, they do things together, and in the process, they learn how to govern themselves. A lot of Americans are worried that the centralization of government and some breakdown of this civil society will undermine democracy itself. Right, right. Yeah, so, so, so it's a bit like um, federalism helps uh, in many ways, but as you mentioned, mm -hmm. it also brings in a, 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 some level of friction in decision making and slowness uh, in some ways in decision making. And um, you mentioned the Commonwealth system. So the Fran, uh, not France, mm -hmm. but India, for example, to have um, you know, it always used to be coalitions. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that, that symptom that you mentioned that anybody who has more than 100 supporters goes off and starts a party. Mm 
um, which, which is, you know, they have the right incentive to do so. And then after the elections, you have this phase where you basically trade for right. power. Right. Um, yeah, and, and I don't know if, if you know, that some of these countries seem to have their constitutions, uh, and I don't know much about this, Charles. I'm just asking you, their constitution sort of a combination of the American ideas and and the and the english uh ideas right did, did any of them really get it right <laughs> <laughs> but i think that's right uh in the commonwealth countries or former uh british colonies and so forth like india of course the big <laughs> to me one of the biggest questions is uh, how did india become a country i mean it's really a it, it's really a, a large geographic area that was never ruled as a unity until it was brought together in various imperial conquests uh the last of which being the the british but and and of course it did uh break apart in uh, 1947 when the when the british uh left and Pakistan was formed, and then East Pakistan is broken off as Bangladesh and so forth. But um, I think that we ought to add in one crucial element, which is particularly important in uh, in uh, uh, Americans thinking about our own uh, government now. And it's been a real problem in uh, India, and that is bureaucracy. Big bureaucracy. Now, it's important to understand <laughs> that when bureaucrats make decisions, they are not democratic decisions. Uh, and <laughs> unless elected leaders have real control over those bureaucrats, then you're being ruled by unelected people. Now, there's a yeah. second problem which uh, India and many other countries have seen, and it was been really true in the United States. The larger bureaucracies become, and the more regulations they put in place, the more uh, economic growth and innovation is inhibited. That's not to say that we don't mm -hmm. that we need no rules. Of course, we need rules, uh, clear rules, but. When you get very detailed regulations, those can only be made by bureaucrats. And what they tend to not take into account is the cost of complying with the regulations. One, well, let, let me add one, one additional thought because yeah. I think it's not obvious to people. When a lot of the regulations are much easier to comply with if you're a big company than if you're a small company. So um, uh, that tends to give an advantage to Amazon over a small online retailer. Um, uh, my son is the head of technology for a, a small company that's an online company. And as soon as rules began to be imposed for different taxes in every different jurisdiction, each city could impose its own taxes on a sale uh, online. Mm -hmm. That was very easy for Amazon to comply with and didn't cost them very much uh, because they could amortize the cost over trillions of dollars in sales but right. if you're a small company yeah. that's a very expensive proposition and it gives a huge advantage to the big companies right right yeah so okay there's again a scale problem mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. so the bureaucracy as you mentioned you know charles the saying goes the english invented the bureaucracy and the english was secular <laughs> uh, and, and Increasingly, a problem for the U.S. as well, right. as you say. Uh, when we look into, let's say, New Zealand, uh, South Korea, it, these are countries that are very efficient uh, from a decision-making mm -hmm. perspective. Uh, they seem to move, um, you know, very in a, in a very nimble fashion when there is there is a risk mm -hmm. and so on. And so, so are those systems again? Is this just a size issue that we are dealing with? Well. Um... 
there are a lot of problems related to bureaucratic uh, lethargy and the costs it imposes on society. And I'm not sure which societies, I mean, we, we know that some societies have gotten it better than others, but we, uh, but it's not clear to me exactly why that is. So one thing that is true in America that is not true in uh, some other countries is that if California imposes a lot of rules that are costly on its uh, businesses, uh, those businesses can move to Arizona or Nevada or Texas or Tennessee where there, or Florida, where there are many fewer rules, where the taxes are lower. So that keeps some pressure on them. What the European Union has tried to do is prevent that competitive quality among its member states. So when states try to reduce the rules so that they can compete more effectively, the European Union says, no, that violates our general rules, and we're going to keep the same rules in place everywhere. So I think that one question is, when uh, bureaucrats say in India make it very uh, they, they tend to make it difficult in part because you just have to go through so many levels of bureaucracy it just takes forever and the same is true now with environmental permitting in the United States if you look at the Pentagon the Pentagon the biggest office building at the time in the world when it was built the whole Pentagon was built from the idea to completion in 18 months, 18 months. <laughs> and, and in fact, when each section of the Pentagon was completed, uh, it was occupied. So the building began to be occupied well before the 18 months was up. You couldn't even get an environmental <laughs> permit in 18 months now, it would take years to get an environmental permit. And you can see with Keystone Pipeline, you get the permit, then they revoke the permit. And all of this imposes a huge cost, which, which is difficult to see on ordinary, you can see the cost on the people who weld the Keystone Pipeline. They are unemployed right away when you set up uh, Biden's right. new rules. What you can't see is the overall costs on the economy uh, so easily. Those are very real, and you see them in India, of course, all the time. Right, right. Yeah, I think that is an important issue. So uh, as you mentioned, if I have a high regulation in California, I have I have substitutes, I can move to Florida, but that is not the case in mm -hmm. EU, right? If I'm a successful company, it is not really possible for me to pick up and go to France. And it is it is the same in India too. So your products and mm -hmm. services are sort of custom designed for, for locations that you know you are sort of pinned down in, in small geographies that you don't have the substitutability. That That's an interesting point there. You're really making two points. One is, is there a unified market for goods and services? Yeah. And that was one of the reasons uh, that, uh, that England had such a, a head start over the continent in terms of the first industrial revolution, the one with cotton spinning and all of that. There was a unified market within... Uh, Britain, uh, not only England, but also uh, Scotland uh, and uh, Ireland were all part of a single market. And then the second question is whether you can uh, escape rules by moving to another location. Uh, you know, uh, you know, we all know the term robber baron. Do you know, do you know where <laughs> the term uh, originated? Okay. I don't. No. Along the Rhine River. I hope you've had a chance at some point in your life to travel along the Rhine. It's so beautiful. Um, but along yeah. the Rhine, there were uh, uh, many, literally dozens and dozens of small principalities. There wasn't a unified Germany until uh, the middle of the 19th century. And each of these barons had a castle that overlooked – 
the Rhine. And when a boat would come down the Rhine, it would be stopped at each new jurisdiction and have to pay a tariff. And those were the barons right. who robbed the traders. Those were <laughs> the original robber barons. So uh, that's the absence of a unified uh, a unified market. One of the great sources of economic growth over the past, uh, well, half century, maybe full century, is uh, the tremendous reduction in transportation and communication costs. Communication especially has gone almost to nothing. Uh, you could be right now talking to me from any place in the world, and we would be paying nothing for this call, right? <laughs> Whereas when I was a child, when I wanted to phone the next town, I had to ask my parents uh, for permission because it was so expensive. That was, that may have even been true for you when you had when you wanted to make a short phone call, but it was right outside of your immediate area. It was expensive. So costs of communication right. have gone to almost nothing, and costs of transportation have gone way down since we have containerized shipping and and all the rest. How else could Amazon exist? Yeah, yeah, and and so 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 going back to this um, this idea that um, bureaucracy regulations they act um, sort of uh, it reduces the flexibility mm -hmm. for the firms, uh, but in certain systems uh, they have some substitutability. But it's not the case everywhere. One aspect of this is, I think, Charles is culture mm -hmm. also, right? So when we look into, let's say, California and Florida, if a firm goes from California to Florida, it can reasonably expect sort of a same workforce, same level of education, right. same language, uh, and let's say same culture. That is not the case in in uh, in large countries or large blocks of countries like the EU. And India, That's a, exactly. an excellent point. And it's also true that if you move your company from New York City to Miami, your employees can move. They don't have to get permission from anybody yeah. to do it. it. It's dislocating and people don't like to do it and all the rest, but, uh, but right. there's no legal restriction on doing it. And, uh, and so there's arbitrage as well. If, um, if um, coders are being paid $200,000 to work in Silicon Valley and $100,000 to work in Nashville doing the same work, then firms are going to start hiring a lot more coders in Nashville, right? And it, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's sort of mm -hmm. interesting, Charles, you know, the... the the Silicon Valley phenomenon is sort of countered to this this idea because, you know, the real estate mm -hmm. prices, the the salaries and so on, uh, used to be a lot higher in Silicon Valley compared to the rest of the country. Um, so, so how do you attribute that, that concentration in, in a very, very small area? Well, there are sometimes, I mean, there's a reason we call civilization comes from the word from the latin yeah. word for city there are tremendous right. uh economies of scale um uh associated with being in a city uh some of them are cultural <laughs> if you if you live uh in a rural area it's hard to uh to find uh, live entertainment all the time or find a wide variety of restaurants and so forth. That's one reason people like to live in cities. But it's also the case that even in uh, our connected economy, there are a lot of things that you need to do face to face. And one of the things that's happening with this COVID uh, year-long uh, lockdown uh, is we're learning which things need to be done face-to-face -face and which things can be done by 
uh, online connections, Zoom and the kind of way you and I are talking now and all the rest. I don't think we know the answer to that. That's changing very rapidly. For example, you, uh, it's very clear that uh, very young children cannot be well-educated uh, online. A, they need face-to-face -face interaction with their teachers. B, a lot of what they're learning is socialization, and they can't get that online. There may be other things right, right. Uh, where, uh, where employees once had to come down and be in a big building downtown and simply don't have to do that any longer. Uh, again, to take my son, who works uh, for a company that's online, uh, his company is headquartered in Kansas City. He and virtually all of the people who work under him are in uh, Austin, Texas, and none of them have an office. They all work from home. They, they do coding and electronic uh, computing work, and they all can can work from their own locations. That's leading, by the way, to, to uh, shifts almost immediately in the way uh, people want to buy housing. They want to buy houses that have an extra room where they can work separate from their bedroom or living room. Right, right. Yeah, I often wondered about this, Charles. So Silicon Valley again, mm -hmm. say, let's say Chicago, right? Schools, uh, well-educated population, good big city, um, weather <laughs> notwithstanding. Uh, Chicago hasn't been able to really, um, really move in that direction, right? Technology, entrepreneurship. Do you think it's just weather that's holding Chicago well, back? It's an interesting thing. I think that, first of all, there's a lot more in Chicago than you might expect if you just looked at it from the outside. But that's going to be true of Cleveland and Pittsburgh and a lot of other places. Uh, you know, Pittsburgh in particular right. is a really wonderful story. I'm moving away from Chicago for a second to just say Pittsburgh. For those uh, sure. people old enough to remember, think of it as a steel city. But that's a city that's now built around Carnegie Mellon and high technology and the University of Pittsburgh's uh, medical center, which pioneered transplants and so forth. It's a city that's really transformed itself. Um, and yeah. uh, not all cities have done that. To do that, you need to have... Uh, great educational institutions, especially in fields that you're most familiar with, uh, technology, engineering, biosciences, physical yeah. sciences, and so on. Um, the other thing is that if people can uh, live in multiple locations, they're going to live in locations they find more attractive. They're going to not, they'll find a lot of things that are attractive about Chicago or Boston, but if they can get the same things in a, in a more temperate climate, they, they will do that. Taxes also will matter. Uh, there are a lot of those uh, features that are driving uh, people to one location or another. And then there are uh, what are called path dependencies. And I'm sure you're your listeners understand that yeah. Chicago, for example, has a very strong network of investment banking for manufacturing uh, that doesn't yeah. exist in the Bay Area. But Chicago has had uh, it, it's had trouble starting up similar um, investment. Uh, uh, skills and organizations and uh, networks for um, for computing and high technology and and look at look at the area around San Diego, which is just filled with all yeah. of these small biotech firms, and I'm sure there must be. Uh, consultants and financiers and others who want to be in the uh, San Diego area because that's such an important area for these startup uh, biotech firms. So there's a there there can be some geographical advantages uh, to these things, but cities. But look, 
uh, manufacturing, it's a, it's a good thing for the Midwest to have a lot of focus on manufacturing and manufacturing is becoming increasingly high tech too. That's right. Yeah. So it's a path dependency in some sense, you have to have uh, some critical, critical size before it really takes off. And, and the question is whether you have the initial conditions set and Pittsburgh, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, is a good example of this. They came from, uh, very little to something uh, something um, very interesting. Um, and uh, perhaps there's some sort of comparative advantage uh, issues here. As you mentioned, manufacturing in Chicago, a lot of space and investments going into manufacturing. Uh, what, what, what happens in the EU? Again, there was a desire there to, you know, to get this 400 million people integrated into an economy, but there's a lot of headwinds there. Yeah, right? I, in, in all I see the EU as having real problems because it is uh, bound by too many regulations. It's it, it's a top down system. There's too little bottom up in the EU, in its governance in particular, and uh, there's a lot more fear uh, about uh, letting the market. Uh, make uh, solutions. Uh, there's a, you can see that in America too. Uh, the Democratic Party is much more committed uh, to uh, centralized regulatory policies than the Republicans are. Uh, and uh, those have real uh, impact on growth. There are other problems. The EU um, has a much a uh, more serious migration and integration problem because of migration from North Africa yeah. and the Middle East. But I would add, I would say that that's not completely separate from the other issue we were talking about. If you look at how Americans are integrated with each other, how you uh, come to be integrated with all sorts of of Americans. You may come from a South Asian background. Somebody else comes from a North African. Somebody else has had a family that's been in America for multiple generations and so forth. Where do they become integrated? Yeah. They become integrated at the University of California at Berkeley and then in their jobs. But if those, uh, but, yeah. uh, but the job market, the more flexible the job market is, the more you're going to have all this kind of mixture according to what people's skills and abilities are. Uh, if you, uh, if you uh, get lifetime tenure, in a job, which is true in France, after about six months, right? You you work in a job, and very quickly you become, um, you it's impossible to fire you, and that seems like uh, uh, something that workers might want. But the, the immediate uh, the the secondary effect of that is that employers won't hire people if they think they might at some point need to let them go because there's not enough business to support it. In America, you can just hire the person and then you can let them go. And the person who is hired, you might say, well, that's terrible news for them. But it, first of all, it means that they do get hired. And secondly, they can make a decision about whether they think the business is going to be strong enough to keep supporting them. Uh, to keep in that job or whether they think, well, maybe the business won't be around, but it's a good job for a year and I'll pick up some skills and I can move to something else. One of the things about Silicon Valley, you know, is that you're, is that yeah. uh, failure of businesses is not a terrible thing, right? You can just start up another right, one. Right. And in a lot of the world, that's simply not true. Well, what's that like in India? If you start a business and it doesn't work, it's a high tech business. Are, are you kind of shamed and have problems in the future? Or is it something where, as I say, in Silicon Valley, you learned on somebody else's money? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I have been away for over yeah. 30 years, but it used to be, Charles, that you cannot start a business. So 
that well, it's, a, it's an interesting <laughs> aspect of how culture matters, because that's not a matter of law. That's a matter of how we treat. And I think in America, part of that derives from the sense in the old uh, American West that you could move West and start your life again. No matter what you'd been back in Ohio or Massachusetts, once you moved out to Kansas, you were a new person. Right, right. Yeah, integration, I think, is a an, is an very important thing. We'll take a quick break. Um, uh, when we come back, we'll talk more about that. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we're back. Uh, Charles, we were talking about uh, political systems across the world um, and uh, related differences um, in terms of growth, employment, and so on. Uh, one of the things that we were talking about before the break is integration. And I want to um, get your perspective on this. So, um, you know, integration is not a property of the system. Um, for instance, you can have very autocratic, um, non-democratic systems uh, getting high levels of integration. Mm -hmm. And so, 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 you know, if integration is important from an economic growth perspective, how does that play into the political systems matrix, so to speak? Well, this goes back to an earlier point uh, where we were talking about how nations are separated from one another. Yeah. Um, and one way of thinking about that, Gil, is to think about nationalism and patriotism. Um, I'm an American citizen. I come from Mississippi originally. I've lived in Massachusetts. I live in Illinois now. Yeah. It doesn't matter where my parents or grandparents or great-grandparents came from. It doesn't matter where yours came from. If you're an American citizen or have a green card, one yeah. is just as American as the next. It doesn't matter what your accent is or what your race is or anything else. Uh, I'm not saying that there's no prejudice in the country or anything like that. But our notion that who is an American is not um, what is sometimes called in Europe a blood and soil national. We have a civic nationalism. So um, it's a problem in places like Germany, whether or not, or Japan, let's say you or I moved to Japan hmm. and we uh, got married to people who had similar backgrounds to yours or mine, and they did that for two or three generations. Would they ever be considered Japanese? No, no. They would never be Japanese and they would never be Chinese. They would never be German. And in fact, it's a problem. Maybe they would be German. Maybe not. It's certainly the case that third generation immigrants to Germany from Turkey are not, they may consider themselves German, but a lot of other Germans don't consider them German. And that's a different kind of nationalism. So, uh, there are uh, differences, and my sense is that England is much better on that than the continent. Yeah. It doesn't have that kind of blood and soil nationalism, but uh, closer to civic nationalism. And America and Canada uh, clearly have, uh, and Australia and so forth, all have this kind of civic nationalism. Where the integration problem arises in America, first of all, it arose over race for many, uh, for centuries, and really was only eliminated as a legal restriction in the mid-1960s. Now the problem is whether people on meritocratic grounds are getting ahead 
And if people are not getting ahead, is it because they're being discriminated against or because they're simply not meeting uh, general standards? And if they're not, why are they not? One of the interesting things to me, Gil, is the rise of Hispanics, not just in population, but their rise socially and economically. It's sometimes missed because we average across Hispanics. But if you look at second and third generation people who've come from Mexico and Central America and South America, they're doing just great in America. Yeah, and it's a large population. I think it's twenty percent of the country mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. now. So, so yeah, I I, I wondered about. So I've been a U.S. citizen, um, Charles, mm-hmm. you know, over twenty five years. I never really thought about integration issues um, this way. But mm-hmm. the last four years uh, have been sort of an eye opener <laughs> for for many people. Right. And I wondered if you get the same answer if you go to 50 different states in the U.S. and ask them, you know, who is an American? Uh, Will we get uniform answers, you think? Well, you might not. That's an interesting point. It's interesting because the Democrats say that the Republicans are a source of this kind of division, which you were kind of alluding to in your last four years. But it's also the case that the Democrats are the ones who are behind identity politics. Who Who is the, by most accounts, the leading Republican uh, in the uh, race to become the nominee in 2024? She's a... Uh, uh, a person whose family came from South Asia. She's a first generation. Right. right. And she was governor, not of some, some sort of urban Northeastern state or California. She was governor of South Carolina. (laughs) So, you know, we need to be pretty cautious about this and look at South Carolina has a Republican black Senator and Georgia has a Democratic black senator. I'm I'm not trying to say that there's not discrimination and so forth, but I think it's a more complex terrain than people are willing to to acknowledge. And uh, But what I do really think is that we need to get away from identity politics because I think it just drives a wedge between us. We need to stop discrimination for sure, but I think the idea that you are first and foremost a Hispanic American or a Catholic or a Jew or, you know, whatever it may be, gay, that that I think those are important criteria. I'm not saying people should uh, should abandon them as part of their understanding of who they are personally. I'm just saying that trying to reinforce all of those by government edict and by political ideology is something that's dividing and harming our country. Yeah, yeah, that that, that makes uh, that makes sense to me. So in some sense, what we're trying to do is to simplify the problem, right? (laughs) Problem is not um, that simple because you have a, a, a very rich feature set. Each individual is an individual uh, but but has rich feature set and mm-hmm. from an integration perspective, what we are saying, I think you know, if if I were to think about this more systematically, I would say, for example, language is an important unification instrument. Um, I, I don't know if you can have a really unified country uh, with multiple languages. In them. But what, what is your what is your perspective on that? Do you know who unified the uh, language of South Asia? Uh, Thomas Babington Macaulay in the 1830s decided yeah. that if you tried to make Urdu or Hindi the language, yeah. it would be very divisive, and that right. the language, the official language of the country, would not be any of the local dialects, would, but would be English. Uh, now, of course, most people don't speak English. Uh, by the way, in in Israel, uh, yeah. the language uh, of the country was made Hebrew around 1900, before it was a country. 
And at the time, nobody spoke Hebrew. It literally nobody spoke it. Uh, it was a religious language uh, for prayer among Jews, but there weren't Jews who every day spoke Hebrew. They wrote, they, many of them in Eastern Europe spoke Yiddish, which was a German uh, dialect written with Hebrew letters. But they decided that as part of making a nation, they would have a common language. So you are quite right. It is a, an important issue, but it's also a very divisive one. If you yeah. look in many countries, uh, Nigeria, for example, when you start to try to impose one language on the country, uh, people who, for whom it is not their primary language often rebel against it. So it's, it's not a simple question. Yeah, it's not a simple question. Uh, but, you know, you, you, um, just as a thought experiment, uh, mm -hmm. Charles, suppose we have country X and we have, you know, different features in this country. Um, you know, let's say it's education, let's say it's language, let's say it's cultural norms mm -hmm. and so on. Um, how would a country um, move toward integration what what would be the actions the country might take i think that you have to have citizens who over time learn to speak at least a common language perhaps not as their first language but where this was a big fight was in california where you had so many people coming in who spoke spanish as their first language and the question was how quickly would their children transition to English in school. The problem is that if you forced all education to be in English from the very beginning, although small children would pick it up very quickly, older ones would pick it up more slowly, and there would be a deficit in what they actually learned in school uh, right. while they were learning the language. But there were also people who didn't want them to learn English at all. Uh, and those uh, were people who said it was going to wipe out their native culture and this, that, and the other. Uh, uh, there were also some fixed interests. If you were a Spanish language radio station or TV station, you didn't want them to learn it. If you were somebody who, uh, there were other fixed interests who didn't want them to do it. But what I would say is that the progress of Hispanic Americans uh, has been uh, exemplary in the sense that uh, over time, uh, the second generation learns English. This is very similar to immigrants who came from Italy and Russia, Poland, and and uh, all the rest uh, during the uh, and China during the uh, Great American Industrial Revolution a century ago. Uh, where it goes slowest is in areas where. Uh, let's say Chinatown in San Francisco, where there's a large enough population that you can live your whole life speaking only your native language. You can go to a doctor, you can go to a pharmacist, you can go to a supermarket, you can go to a clothing store and never have to speak English. You can speak Chinese. That's very helpful for that first generation, but it will inhibit the slow integration of their children and their children's children into the larger society. It's critical that they learn those skills, not because those skills are inherently, English language skills are inherently better than Chinese, yeah. but because uh, if the country as a whole uh, speaks English, how can you become vice president of a large corporation if you don't speak English well? Yeah, so, so localization and sort of clumping um, of, of cultures, I, I think it's becoming potentially an increasing issue for us. Uh, how is EU handling it? I mean, they, they have naturally, they, they have a natural initial conditions of perfect clumping to start with. So there's an intent in terms of unified markets, but, but what, what, what are they doing in this direction? Well, for one thing, educated Europeans are much more multilingual uh, yep. than Americans or Canadians or Australians or Japanese. Uh, um, an educated European can speak French, German, and English. 
uh, yeah. you can just take that for granted. Maybe in Italy, they they lack one of those languages. As you move down the education scale, they tend to speak uh, their native language and maybe a little bit of another language. But I think uh, the issue, let's go to Israel again. Every child yeah. uh, speaks Hebrew, right? And right. let's take uh, uh, kids who live in Israel proper. They, uh, they all learn Hebrew as their first language. That's the language of instruction in the fifth grade. English is their second language. Uh, uh, Arabic is their third language. Uh, if they are native Arabic speakers, uh, let's say in the West Bank, uh, Arab is their first language. Hebrew is their second language. English is their third language, and not all of them get English. But they have to have Hebrew if they're to uh, work with Israelis, and it's the largest economy uh, in the area. So they need both languages. And many, many Israelis do have Arabic, but they they all have English Uh I wouldn't say that all, I shouldn't say all of them. If you get in a cab in Israel, yeah. uh, you cannot assume that the cab driver speaks English. Mm-hmm. So, so this multilingualism, mm-hmm. um, uh, Europeans appear to have sort of a natural talent for it. Um, that's probably because you have proximity to it and, and, and there is probably travel uh, is a lot higher right, right. across across languages right right from the beginning um that is so so you know coming back to this local problem that we have in the u.s um would you would you try to correct this from a policy perspective i know that for example in india they're going in the other direction um you know it is is reasonably prevalent in the country at least at a very basic level uh, I think some new policy is that kids should not be taught English till they turn 10 years old or something like that. So, so, so there's some countries going in other direction. What, what could the U.S. policy be? Uh, what can be reasonably accomplished? What should the policy be in the U.S. or what should U.S. policy yeah. be toward countries like India? Yeah. So in the U.S., uh, you know, we have, you know, like you mentioned California, we have increasing patches um, of communities and and cultures uh, who appear to get localized in in clumps, right? Um, and so that, in the long run, is going to have uh, an integration problem. Right. I, I don't have any brilliant insights into this. I, I do think everybody who comes to America should have a chance to learn English at no cost. Uh, I think that education uh, in uh, lower schools should concentrate first on educating the children and secondarily on having them acquire English. But I wouldn't want them to fall behind in learning how to read or learning mathematics, let's say, because they were their first language was uh, Filipina uh, the, uh, the was was let's say Thai or uh, or his or Spanish or or something else. But I do think that you have to push very hard for a common language. Again, not with the idea that the common language is quote better in some sense, but in the sense that it's the only way to integrate people. So this is the problem in many. Uh, in many countries, that if you choose one language, you're also choosing one ethnic group or tribe to dominate the others. And that is a serious problem that I have not really thought through because Americans don't have to confront it. We don't have to say, well, if uh, if you choose to speak French, uh, that's one thing. And if you choose to speak Arabic, uh, that's another. And if our country decides on one or the other, it's deciding on which political group will be the dominant one in that country. So uh, we simply uh, 
have avoided that, and I hope we will continue to. But as I say, I really don't like the identity politics where the identity is not feeling proud of simply the fact that your family came to the United States from one country and mine came from another country, but a kind of continuing feeling that we are somehow separated from each other and are separate groups because of that. I don't think that's so. Yeah, I, I want to touch on China a little bit, uh, Charles. So um, autocratic systems, good leaders, if you look at the metrics, it, it is phenomenal. The increase per capita GDP by, by, a, uh, by a factor. Um, and uh, I think I saw some, some data that's, uh, that showed that only China had positive economic growth in 2020 <laughs> uh, for, for, for a variety of reasons. So uh, are we finding uh, a system that seems to do pretty well, even though it's not democratic? Well, um, China has, first of all, I don't trust China's growth statistics, and I, I don't think uh, uh, yeah. sophisticated economists do, because I'm not an economist, I'm a political scientist, but uh, they, uh, if you look at people who are uh, uh, attentive to markets, look at things like energy consumption and other things that might give them a, a clearer measure of whether China is growing or not. China is incorporating people from low growth agricultural areas into higher growth uh, industrial and manufacturing areas and service areas. And uh, it has had a clear uh, framework for doing that. But there is, um, uh, but their repressive system uh, is an awful thing in itself. And I would say that you also have a problem of misallocation of capital because uh, you, you don't have uh, market forces determining where capital should go. You have political actors determining that, and that can they can not only make particular kinds of mistakes, they can it can also be very corrupt. So you're my brother-in-law, and I can funnel money uh, to you so that your business prospers, even though. Uh, the business uh, next door might be a better business and might be more deserving of growth. Mm. Uh, but purely from a data perspective, uh, Charles, you know, if you look to uh, India close by, um, you know, uh, a democratic system, uh, nobody, I think, would argue China's growth is, is so much higher than when, what India has accomplished. So how do you contrast these two? These two My these two? sense about India is that their growth will increase as they can rid themselves of the non-democratic aspects of their state, namely this excessive bureaucracy. But they also have a real problem that China does not with infrastructure. China can build highways, and that's partly, and they can build uh, electronic, they can move people around to clear way for new roads, and they can move out whole neighborhoods if they want, whole cities. They can build whole new cities, uh, even if that involves clearing away the native population, and they can do that because they're a dictatorship. The question is, for countries like India, is how do you build new roads? How do you build uh, uh, transportation systems, uh, communication systems, and so forth that involve dislocation when you have so many groups that can stand in the way of it? Uh, so that's a, that's a problem in all democracies, and it's a big problem in India. Yeah, so you know, some have argued that uh, developing countries are set uh, back uh, by dem democratic systems because slowness in decision making and, and, and so on. Uh, if that is true, it has implications for many of the African countries too, right? So, so, so what's the answer well, to that? Well, first of all, I, I, I'm not 
uh, one of those people who tend to approach things like uh, Plato and say, what's the ideal system? And then we should go out and yeah. try to impose that. I would say uh, that in sub-Saharan Africa, um, e even if you don't think democratic systems are good, look at what, uh, look at what non-democratic systems have done. They've been awful. And they've not only been repressive, they've been uh, what economists call rent extraction systems. That is, the government, if the government can make you rich, it can ask you to give back to the, to the policymakers who are making you rich nearly all of that money, which they will then put in their uh, Swiss bank accounts. Uh, so uh, it's a terrible thing if... Uh, and you can see, even in the United States, uh, the more powerful the government, central government has become, the more it can enrich corporations, the more money they spend on lobbying in Washington to get those outcomes. Um, so I, I don't know. The question, I guess, in, in, in many uh, uh, of these countries is not whether democracy is better than, uh, than dictatorship but that they can only grow if there is a stable government and a stable set of rules uh, for property and law, where if you and I make an agreement, we know that it will stick, even if you don't want to stick to it. So if, if you rent me a, uh, an apartment in a building you own in California or in Illinois or in Mississippi, uh, and you want to boot me out yeah. after six months because somebody comes in and says they'll pay you more rent. You can't do that. I have a contract that won't allow you to do that. But in a system without a rule of law, you can do that. And because of that, people won't, uh, there are, people will take self-protective actions, which lead to reduced economic growth because they don't want to be in a position where they get cheated. Who wants to explore for oil right now in Venezuela? It's unstable. You don't know. You not only might your uh, oil exploration rig be attacked, you don't know. If it takes five or 10 years for that project to pay out, and become economically successful. You don't know if the government that's going to exist in Venezuela in five or 10 years will allow you to keep the project. So you'd be a fool to go in and try to explore for oil there. Whereas that, that's just not true in uh, countries with a stable rule of law. Some democratic countries have it, some don't. Most dictatorships don't have it. And that's a real problem for their growth. They, they can be the, your business at any moment, they can come in, the Communist Party of China can come in and say, we want to own 51% of it. And you'll sell it to us at very low cost. Right, right. Yeah, so, so the legal system is foundational. It's sort of a right. necessary condition uh, for, for a stable um, right. But system. you have to have a stable society as well. You have to have a stable legal system. But you and, and this is what has been so scary about America's divisions over the past few years is that it seems like people are not treating each other as democratic opponents. They're calling each other treasonous, <laughs> traitors, uh, insurrectionists. And some people have behaved that way. They've uh, smashed windows. They've invaded our capital. This is not, uh, these are not hallmarks of a stable democracy. <laughs> and so in conclusion, Charles, if you look forward yes. five, 10 years, I, I, I would <laughs> love, love for you to speculate a bit. Um, so we appear to be going through a bit of a transition um, in many aspects. Uh, and so, you know, speculate about the U.S. where we are going to be, let's say, five, ten years from now, and, and more generally about the world. Um, you know, both in terms of political systems, uh, 
uh, and stability and economic growth? Where do you think we will be? Let me tell you what my greatest fears are and then what my greatest hopes are. My greatest fears are nuclear proliferation uh, in the hands of countries that don't have good, stable leadership or control over the weapons. Uh, It doesn't take very many uh, loose nukes. Uh, to create real problems, and you see that with North Korea and Iran. Uh, The problem in developed countries is that we are now going through the fourth industrial revolution, which is very dislocating uh, what's often called the second industrial revolution, which is the late 19th century uh, uh, big oil, electricity, uh, automobile companies, things like that big industries um, uh, with huge amounts of immigration led to in a huge growth of cities all over Europe, all over the United States, all over Britain. Uh, this led to tremendous social dislocation. We are now going through something yeah. that is similar, I would say, in the United States. We're going through a fourth industrial revolution, which is both in uh, communications, AI, all of that computer side of things, and in biotechnology. The two will merge because we're using big data to sort through uh, genomics and so forth. But we're going through a big industrial revolution, and there are winners in that, and there are big losers in that. And the question then is, how do you incorporate them into a stable polity as we move forward? My optimism is that we will uh, be able to do so. My pessimism about it is that both parties in the United States, both political parties are being roiled by it. Uh, um, We just don't know how this will uh, shake out. What we do know is that if we can remain stable, we will be a much richer country, a much richer Western Europe and England and North America, and I hope the whole world in five or 10 years. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like leadership um, it is going to be one of the most important metric um, that will ultimately differentiate. I agree, and I would states. say that uh, we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't appreciate the importance of leadership among opposition parties. Uh, the opposition, yeah. uh, those in power, have to treat responsible opposition parties as if they are part of the political system. And the opposition parties themselves have to treat um, the the government in power as a uh, legitimate. If we, the key issue, I think, for our time in these advanced democracies is the issue of legitimacy. Are the governments considered legitimate? So as we move forward, that's an issue that I hope the listeners to Scientific Sense podcast will be uh, will have uppermost in their mind. Do we consider uh, the political those who govern us and those who oppose them within the political system both to be legitimate? Right, right. Excellent. Uh, thanks so much. It for spending is absolutely time with you, my Charles. pleasure, Gil. I hope we'll have a chance to do it again. Thank you. Take care. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.